Okay, let me ask you a question. Raise your hand. I know this makes people nervous every time I say that. Raise your hand if you were born in Rush County. Okay? Ooh, not. First service, there was lots of people. Okay? So, um, so I'm assuming you grew up around here, and so you would call this your hometown. Now, raise your hand if you grew up and you called your hometown another place in Indiana outside of Rush County. Hey, more people. All right, we're all best friends. Awesome. Okay, now let's go for you outsiders who we love in a special way. If you were born and you called your hometown where you grew up outside of Indiana. Yeah, look at you guys. Yes, welcome to Indiana. Glad you're here. Thank you for coming. So your hometown is special. It's special because it represents a part of your story, represents a part of who you are, your family. There's special memories. There's things that connect you to that. Now, for me, I grew up about an hour and a half north on State Road 3, Zanesville, Indiana, not to be confused with Zanesville, Ohio. Zanesville, Indiana, today currently has a population of 611 people. So a little bit bigger than what you would find in the population of, for example, Mays. But Zanesville, Indiana is where I grew up. And it has special memories for me. Now, again, hometowns, it's part of your story, can have some sentimental connection. The other thing, each hometown is unique. I think we would all agree. Each of our hometowns that we grew up in are unique. There's something special about that. My hometown of Zanesville, Indiana, is unique because there was a time period per population that it had the most twins born in this time period per population than any other town in the United States. Whoa, that's pretty cool. They've always said there was something in the water since we were close to the power plant. No, there wasn't, there wasn't a power plant. Um, but what's neat about that is I was a part of that. I'm a twin. And so me and my twin were a part of this record-breaking group that for a period of time was right there leading our nation. To the point that several years ago, Zanesville had homespun days, which that was our day to celebrate, Zanesville, and they invited all the twins to be the parade marshals. You did not know you were in the presence of a celebrity. Yes. So if you are in the record books for your hometown or not, it is special to you. It's unique, and it is something, again, that is a part of your story. Well, today we're going to see, as we continue in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see a hometown. But unfortunately, this hometown reunion was not met with a parade, and this person was not made the parade marshal. We're going to see at the beginning of Mark chapter 6 when Jesus comes home to his hometown. Now, there's two times recorded in the Gospels where Jesus comes home to his hometown during his three-year public ministry. The one we're going to look at today is when he comes back with his disciples. There's another time that's recorded that the people of Nazareth tried to kill him. Jesus was not received with open arms. There was no parade. There was not even faith that he was who he said he was. There was a rejection of Jesus. And so what I want us to look at is how we can live our life in a way that we never reject Jesus. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the Son of God who died on a cross for our atonement so we could be forgiven and be children of God. Jesus is who the Old Testament was pointing to. But this small town, his hometown, rejected him. It's estimated that at the time that Jesus lived there, 
that there would have been around 150 to 200 people. They knew him. They knew his family. At this time, his mom and even some of his siblings, if not all of his siblings, still lived in this town. A town where everybody knew everybody. But this town rejected Jesus. They rejected his teaching. They rejected who he was. And the result is that historians and scholars reveal that there was not a New Testament church in Nazareth for over 300 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. You see, not only is there consequences for unbelief in who Jesus is, but there's consequences for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So we want to see this with a heart that's open to say, God, please, may I never reject Jesus and always in faith give my life to him because this town did not. And it impacted them for over 300 years. So let's go ahead and see what happened. Let's go ahead and, and see what this reveals of how we need to be careful to not reject Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. We're going to look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, where Jesus comes to his hometown with his disciples, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Now you could think it should stop there. Many were amazed, and many came to faith, and Jesus did many miracles, and there was such a revival in that town that impacted that town for generations. But that's not what we read. Many were amazed, and then asked, where did this man get these things? They asked, what's the wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters? Aren't they here with us? And they took offense at him. They were offended. They were offended. Aren't, this, aren't, these, aren't his sisters with us? They took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. That's not a good thing. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And again, to the point that 300 years, there was not a believing Christian presence in that town. Well, let's see what we can learn from this. The first thing I want us to see here is that people reject Jesus when he doesn't fit our expectations. People reject Jesus when he doesn't fit our expectations. Now, I believe what surprised the people of Nazareth, because they knew him, that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue like a rabbi, like a Jewish teacher, to the point that he had even brought pupils, disciples. That's what rabbi do. You see, they knew him, and they knew that he did not follow the traditional path to become a rabbi. To become a rabbi, you had to be under a rabbi. You had to be taught by a rabbi. There was even a school of rabbi. But Jesus did not go that path. You see, Jesus didn't meet their expectations. His path was not orthodox. His path was not one that they could 
control and say, yes, I give my stamp of approval. This is why he is teaching this way. And as a result, they rejected the very breath of God, the very truth of God, the very word of God who was there in their presence. The very one that the Old Testament was written for, written through, and written about was there. But because he didn't meet their expectations, his path to teaching the way that they thought should have been gone through as under rabbi training. Now we know that Jesus did not submit to rabbi training or mentoring because he was God. He is God. We know that man could not teach the spiritual things to God because all spiritual things come from God and God was there in person. But because he did not fit what they thought was the path for him to have this wisdom, they were offended. They rejected him. They could not reject that his teaching was out of this world. They knew that this teaching was beyond man, but because it did not fit what they thought would lead to that, they rejected it. Not only that, but because they knew him so well, someone from the home of a carpenter couldn't be speaking like this. And look, it says, they scoffed. They scoffed at his teaching. He's just a carpenter. Someone with that authority and power surely could not be a carpenter. Someone with that authority and power surely could not have gone without being taught by the greatest rabbis of that time. Even to the point that they rejected the miracles. Verse 2 says, they ask, where did he get all the wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? You see, his family was still at Nazareth. His family was still there. Word had been out of the miracles that he had done. There is no question that they had heard about the healings, about the miracles. They even recognized that this wisdom is associated with the miracles he's done, but they rejected it all. Here's just a quick capture of the miracles that Mark records not even including the other ones at the other Gospels, but here's just some of the miracles where Jesus had healed. Mark 1, 29 through 31, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Mark 1, 32 through 34, many more were healed in Capernaum. Mark 1, 40 through 45, he healed a leper. Mark 2, 1 through 12, he healed a paralyzed man. Mark 3, 1 through 6, he healed a man with a deformed hand. Mark 3, 7 through 12, many again. And we're talking about many were healed by Jesus. As we saw a couple weeks ago, Jesus miraculously calmed the storm and the waves that were of hurricane type measure. And then he cast out the man that had many demons. He cast out many demons out of that man. And then he healed the woman in Mark 5, 25 through 34, who bled for 12 years. And then he healed this young girl, Jairus' daughter, and brings her back to life. But his hometown not only denied the teaching, they denied the miracles because Jesus didn't fit in their little box. He didn't fit in their little box. How many times do we see that today? When God doesn't meet our expectations, our faith struggles. When God doesn't meet our expectations, how many times have we pulled away from God? Well, this is what happened in Nazareth. What they expected a rabbi to be was not who Jesus was, and so they rejected the teaching. What they expected a miracle worker to be. Well, it couldn't be that hometown boy we know, the carpenter. 
and they rejected the very things of God. They rejected the very person of God, the very presence of God. I think when we find ourselves most disappointed with life, it's not because something in life has failed us, but rather our expectations of what we thought life would be have failed us. And if we're honest, the times we even find ourselves disappointed with God, I'm here to tell you it's not because God has failed you. But it's our expectations of God have failed us. When we rely or stumble over expectations, we are lacking the faith to trust God. You see, there are expectations based upon the promises of God. That is faith and trust in God. But when it's what we want, when it's our desires, separate from what is promised in God's word, and they might be good things, but when we allow our expectations to be greater than our faith and trust in the God who is faithful no matter what happens, that is when we end up tripping over the very things that we find that give us control. Expectations separate from faith in God are ultimately an effort to control something. And that hometown couldn't control who was there teaching miraculous wisdom. They couldn't control him. They could not make it sin, make sense in their mind. It could not be an equation that led to the outcome. But instead of faith, they rejected the very truth and presence of God in front of them. And as it says in verse 6, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Church, we walk by faith, not by sight. We cannot, we cannot control what happens in this life. We cannot rely on what we know or what we can determine. There is a holy, awesome God that holds all things together. And that holy, awesome God came in the fullness of his son, Jesus, that says that he sustains and holds all things. Where is your faith? May it be in King Jesus. These people rejected King Jesus and their expectations led them away from God. The second thing that we see here is that people reject Jesus when he doesn't fit our comfort zone. People reject Jesus when he doesn't fit our comfort zone. To better understand this in context, let's look again at verse 3. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Now that word offense here is the Greek word scandalizo, which we get the English word. Anyone want to help me? Scandal, scandalized. They were scandalized at Jesus. They were scandalized at Jesus. And so that, because they chose to be scandalized, they were separate from faith. And because they did not have faith, they did not hear what Jesus was saying. They could not receive who he was. Why were they scandalized? Well, again, we know he didn't meet their expectations of what a rabbi, how they should study. And so there's no way he could be speaking this way. There's no way he could have that wisdom because he didn't follow the path that would lead to being a rabbi. But there was more than that. Because did you notice how they addressed him or how they called him? They said, Mary's son. Now for us in our culture, 
today, I would much rather people say, I'm Mary Alice's son than Rollins' son. Because if they say I'm Rollins' son, they'd be like, oh, here we go. Another story, you know. But the truth is, in the Jewish culture, if you were called the son of the mother and not the son of the father, that was an insult and that was an attack on your character or legitimacy. Because a son was known by the father's name in the Jewish culture. Not that the women were not important, but that is how God had established it, that a son was known by his father's name. So, for example, it would be the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they would be called James and John bar Zebedee, son of Zebedee. They were not called James and John, son of the mom's name. So for them to not only say, well, he's just a carpenter, for them to be able to judge him because he didn't train under the rabbis, it was more offensive for them to say, this is Mary's son. Now, we don't know why. We don't know why. We do believe that Joseph was dead by this point. There is no other record of Joseph at any point in Jesus' ministry. So it is believed that Joseph had died at this point. But even, even if he was dead, they would still refer to Jesus as Bar Joseph. There was a scandal. Now, we know that Joseph was the legal father, but God miraculously, miraculously, brought Jesus into conception in his mother's womb. It was a miraculous conception. Did they know that? We don't know. But all we know is they're calling scandal and they were offended. To the point to say that he is the son of Mary would not only really question legitimacy, but even to the point of being unclean if you were an illegitimate child. Do you see what's going on here? There was judgment. There was offense because Jesus was out of their comfort zone. Jesus wasn't wrapped in this perfect little box, his family, this perfect little box, because it was not something they could control. That's something that actually made them feel out of control. They were scandalized and they were offended because Jesus, again, did not fit in what was comfortable. If any of you have been a believer long enough, you know that the times that your faith grows is when God is leading you into something that's uncomfortable. Anybody got an amen to that? Yeah. If you want your faith to grow, God is going to stretch you and you're going to enter into a season that your faith is stretched or challenged because ultimately when our faith is challenged or stressed, it's stretched, it's then that we press into God and that we actually rely more on God. So if you're going through a struggle or a trial, do not blame God, press into God because God is wanting to give you more faith so that you can trust him more. Or how many times where God was saying, putting on your heart, yeah, go and share your faith. Go and teach these kids. Go and do this. The times that our faith doesn't grow are the times we are comfortable. And we just find a sideline and we just sit and we watch everything go by. And the challenge for us is, is that if we're in the convenient or in the comfortable, I question, are you following God's leading? And I know that feels like fingers pointed at you, but I'm saying it in love because so many times I've gotten comfortable and those were the times that I was rejecting where God was leading because I was afraid. And so in faith, we go where it's not comfortable. In faith, we follow 
Because the opposite of faith is comfort. The opposite of faith and trust is choosing what's easy. And you see, what they were faced with that day was a miracle worker. They were faced with a teacher who was speaking God's words. And because it was uncomfortable, they dismissed it. They were deaf to the truth. They were blind to God in front of them because he didn't fit their comfort zone. Church, how many times do we do that? How many times do we struggle with that? We want Jesus, but only if he fits our comfort zone. We believe in Jesus if we can live how we want. We will accept Jesus if it doesn't cost us too much. But here's the thing. Comfortable and convenient is the opposite of faith. And comfortable and convenient is the opposite of following Jesus. This is what Jesus said. In Luke 9, 23 through 27. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. That's uncomfortable. To be able to say, it's not about me. I want to die to myself so that Jesus is my life. That is uncomfortable. But that is when we see Jesus increase and we decrease. That is when we see that we actually are living to follow him and not living for what we want. Jesus said, first, you must deny yourself and then take up your cross daily, which means die to yourself. Then you will follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Choosing Jesus and following Jesus will offend our comfort zone. Believing in Jesus and living in Jesus will scandalize our sin, will scandalize our selfishness. But Jesus died not for us to live for ourselves, but Jesus died to give us life so we could live for him. And the people in Nazareth that day rejected Jesus because he was not what they expected and what he was teaching and who he was was not comfortable for them. And they were, as John says, among those who rejected Jesus. John 1, 10 through 12 says, He, Jesus, came into the very world He created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people. And even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. That same choice is upon us today. And so I ask, do you believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died for your sins? And that he came back to life three days later. And he's at the right hand of the Father and he's coming back to take us home. I hope and I pray that you believe that. Because to believe that then means we accept. We accept him. And to accept him is to choose him, to follow him, to live for him, and to know that life is found when we live for Jesus. This world is selling us a load of garbage. This world is telling us that we can be happy by what we have. That is a load of garbage. This world is telling us that if you are popular, successful, if you have people's attention, that you are happy, or that success is based upon what the world says, that is garbage. True life, true happiness, true joy is to not only believe in Jesus, but accept him by living for him. Because all those things will pass away. All those things. Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't store your treasures up on this earth where they will spoil and rust. Store your treasures in heaven 
because the true treasure is Jesus. And the true treasure is living for him. Now, does that mean we're going to be perfect? No. Jesus canceled the perfection clause. So if you're trying to be perfect for Jesus, you're climbing up the wrong mountain. Because the only thing that matters is living for Jesus, and it's through grace that we live for him. He does for us what we don't deserve and can't obtain. So it's about relationship and not rules. It's about relationship and not religion. It's about Jesus and not about us. That is when we find what it means to follow. That is, that is when we find who the true king of our heart is. Because if we stay in comfort and if we continue to seek our expectations, the truth is there is a king, but the king is us. I don't know about you. I've lived that life. I've lived that life. I've pursued what I thought I wanted. I pursued what I thought I needed. And whenever I'm king, I am lost. I am miserable, and I am broken, and just as lost as the world. For there is one king, his name is Jesus. And in Nazareth that day, they rejected King Jesus. And for generations, they were plagued with unbelief. Church, each family, each individual, please make Jesus king of your life. And let that be an example for the next generation so they can choose Jesus. I've shared before that my mom grew up in a home where they were not believers. For generations before her, they were unbelievers. But a friend in junior high invited my mom to church and actually lived her life in a way that made Jesus attractive to her. And my mom gave her life to Jesus and she broke a generational curse. And she, by example, gave me and my siblings every reason to believe in King Jesus. And that is my heart for my kids and for the next generation and the next generation. May that be your heart as well. May we be a stepping stone for the next generation to believe in Jesus. May we be a stepping stone because he is king. He is coming back and every knee will bow and tongue confess. But let's proclaim his majesty now. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you and I just pray, God, that this truth will be received by each one. That whatever nugget of truth, whatever point of direction or even correction, that we would receive it in grace because you speak it, God, in kindness. Your kindness leads us to repentance. You're not standing there in judgment. You're standing there in love. And if we are living for the world, God, may we feel your love and may we choose Jesus. And God, not just for us, but may we be a light to the next generation. May we be a light to the next generation. In all of it, God, we thank you for who Jesus is and what he has done. May we believe. May we accept him. May we live for him and follow him because you are the Father, the holy, awesome God who loved us so much that you sent your son so we could be your sons and daughters. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.